it would be unkind on my part if I didn't take just a moment to express my appreciation for the presence of each of you. I recognize we've come together to worship God, and yet I've been edified and encouraged by our singing and by your presence at this time that we could come and to give our God and our Father praise and to encourage one another. So many here that I love dearly, and you mean so much to me, and I think of this group often, different ones I see from Friendship and East Cheatham and County Line and different places. And I just want you to know how thankful I am for where you, what you do and where you serve the Lord. And good to have some preaching brethren. Brother Pruitt preaches at Little Marabone and Brother David Finney. And I would name everyone, but I might leave someone out and I've got enough enemies as it is. But uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate you coming. If you take your Bible this afternoon, look with me if you will in the book of Philippians and the third chapter. And when you come to the writing of the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the church at Philippi, I want you to examine a statement the Apostle makes in chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. I want you to look at the phrase, rejoice in the Lord. I've often thought about how many times the Apostle Paul in his writings talks about rejoice. And then I've thought about how important <clears throat> excuse me, feelings are in worshiping God. But now for just a moment, what I want to do is put three words in your mind. I want you to think about these three words, and they're very important. I want you to think of the words facts, faith, and feelings. And what I want to stop and think about for the time this afternoon is it's important that we place those words in the proper order. Facts, faith, and feelings. Because I want to tell you that there's a great danger with many and they fail to put these in the right order and thus as a result they fail to get the right result. And so for a few moments I want to talk about facts, faith, and feelings. The first thing I want you to recognize is that we must have that order correctly. Because many times what an individual do is they base everything upon their feeling. And what they do is they let their feeling be their guide. And they do not go to God's Word and they do not base their life upon what is said as a fact, but they lead their lives based on how they feel. I don't know how many times I've heard people say to me, Preacher, that may be what you believe, but I believe something different. Then I say, well, let's look at the Bible, and what does the Bible say? And then they want to dispute the Bible. And they say, well, I don't think God would want me to be unhappy. God wants me to be happy, and thus I am going to base my life on how I feel. But I want you to recognize this afternoon, feelings can be misleading. Open your Bible to the book of Proverbs and the 14th chapter. And when you look in the book of Proverbs and the 14th chapter, notice with me, if you will kindly, the statement in verse 12. In Proverbs 14, 12, the wise man said, There is a way that seems right to a man. But watch it. But its end is the way of death. I want you to notice that man said it feels right or it seems right. But notice the wise man said it is not right. Just because you feel a certain way does not mean that it's correct way. So many people live their life and lead their life by putting their faith in how they feel. Then others will put faith first. And they say that all one has to believe is what they want to believe. And they don't understand the proper order. That one must put their faith not in their feelings or not in what they would believe without any factual background. What one must do is understand the true order. Open your Bible to the Roman letter and the 10th chapter. In the Roman letter and the 10th chapter, notice with me the statement we talked about this morning in Bible class, where in verse 17 the divine word said, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith must be in the facts. Faith must be based upon what God has revealed to us. Do you recognize this morning all we know about God is what He has revealed to us? 
None of us are so smart that we can pretend to have any idea about who God is unless God told us. Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he lets them know that God has revealed Himself to us. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the thing of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You want to know this afternoon why it's important we study this book? You want to know this afternoon why it's important we have the divine revelation? Because this is God's Word to man. This is what God has made known to you and what God has made known to me. I would not know God separate and apart from His Word. So this afternoon, I tell you the first thing I must do in religion, the first thing I must do in life is to understand the facts of God's Word. What is it God has revealed to you and what is it God has revealed to me? The first thing I think we can put down is that you can understand from God's Word that it is a divine fact. God loves us. Now sometimes I've thought about how could God love me? I recognize that I'm a filthy sinner. I recognize my frame that I'm dust. I recognize my weaknesses, and yet the divine word said it is a fact. God loves me, and God loves you. Open your Bible to the book of John in the third chapter. And most of you can quote John 3 and verse 16. But have we ever touched the hem of what he said? In John 3, 16, he said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is a divine fact. God loves you. Open your Bible to the Roman letter and the fifth chapter. And I want you to understand not only did God tell you He loved you, God showed you He loved you. In the Roman letter and the fifth chapter, look in verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God, watch it, demonstrates. God has shown His own love toward us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you look at the cross of Calvary, what you see is the greatest demonstration of love ever shown to man. God showing how much your soul is worth to Him. What, he mean, what you mean to Him, that He would send His Son to die for you. So the fact is we find that Jesus and God and the Spirit all love us. Have you ever thought about that as a divine fact? That's something I can put down. That's something I can put my finger on in the book. And I do not have to question it. I don't have to guess about it. It is a fact. God has revealed it to me. But I want to tell you something else. Have you ever thought that when you think about the love of God and you think about the death, burial, and resurrection, have you thought about the facts of the gospel? That Jesus died and Jesus was buried and Jesus was raised, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And because of His death and because that He was raised from the dead, we now understand the good news. What's the good news? That through that death, through that blood, we can have our sins justified. We can have our sins written, removed by the blood of Christ. You know that's a fact. Open your Bible just to show you in 1 Corinthians 15 what Paul had to say. That way you don't have to take my words. You can put your finger on it and say, yep, that's what God said. In 1 Corinthians 15, look at what he said in verse 3. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. That, watch it, Christ died for our sins according to what? The Scriptures, the facts. And notice, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to what? The Scriptures, the facts, and that He was seen by these individuals. 
Have you ever stopped to think that the death, burial, and the resurrection is good news? Because it's through His death, through His blood, through that sacrifice, my sins can be blotted out. Have you ever been able to look at the Word and say, that is a fact. That every obstacle has been removed, that I can have my sins blotted out. Sin is the barrier, Isaiah 59, 2 said. Sin is what separated me from God. God is the one that removed the barrier through the blood of His Son. Now then, when I think about His Son, I recognize He's my mediator. He's my, also my intercessor, as, as we wrote, read this morning in Romans 8. But I want you to think about something else. When I come to God and I obey God, and I do what God has told me to do, then I'm added to His family. I'm born again, as Jesus said in John 3, 3 through 5. I've been adopted into the family of God as is taught in Acts 2, 47. Now I'm a child of God. I'm an heir. And now I've been seated with Christ, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6. When one is baptized into Christ, what does it say in Romans 6, 3 through 6? That you're buried with Christ. You're raised up to walk in what? Newness of life. Sins blotted out, added to the family of God. Sins remitted by the blood of Christ. And you know what, my friend? When one obeys by faith, it's a fact God will forgive you. Open your Bible and we've read it time and time again in Acts 2.38. What did they do on the day of Pentecost? When they were pricked in the heart. What did Peter say? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you can have your sins remitted. Well, preacher, what happens after I fall short, after I've been baptized? What did he say in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So I need to recognize the facts of the Scripture. Open your Bible, if you will, for just a moment to the Hebrew letter and the second chapter. And another fact we need to get down is the fact that miracles have ceased. We need to understand that we now preach a word that has already been confirmed. When I hear people today say that God gave them a new revelation, you know what I tell them? Perform a miracle. Because in the days that they were speaking in Hebrews 2, they were able to show what they were teaching was from God by performing miracles. We don't have that today. Why? The word has already been confirmed. We have God's revelation in the book. God's still not revealing things to you and to another individual something else. He's revealed us all the same standard. In your Bible, in the Hebrew letter, in the second chapter, look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and watch it, was confirmed to us by those who heard Him, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. I recognize that miracles have ceased. The Word has already been confirmed. You know what I preached this afternoon? The Word of God that has already been confirmed. Now then, those are the facts. But I want you to think of another fact. Open your Bible to Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, have you ever thought of the fact we have hope of eternal life because of what God has done for us? In the book of Titus and the first chapter, look at the statement made in verse 2. In Titus 1, 2, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Have you ever thought, my friend, that's a fact? God has promised hope. God has promised life beyond the grave. God has promised eternal life to those who are His, to those who are His children, to those who've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now then, what do I need to do? If that is the facts of this thing, what do I need to do? I need to put my faith in those facts. I need to hear those things that God's Word has revealed. And I don't need to think about getting that in some mysterious way or by some experience. I can take the book of God. You know, my friend, if Mike Richardson can understand some of these things, you can understand it. I may not know much about the Bible, but I know this much, that I can put my faith in what God has clearly expressed. 
And I can put my finger on God's Word and say, God has said He loved me. He said He sent His Son to die for my sins. He told me I need to be a child of His to have my sins blotted out. I must obey His Word. And I recognize I have everything I need right here. I don't need the book of Jehovah's Witness or the book of Mormon. I don't need a creed or a catechism. I have what I need right here. And then I can become a child of God. I can have the hope of eternal life. That's where I need to put my faith. Faith is based upon the facts we read about, not based on our feelings. And I want to tell you what happens sometimes. Sometimes some of my brethren major on what we don't know instead of upon the facts of what we do know. And I see many times they're ready to tear and divide the body of Christ asunder over assumptions. I would rather stand on what I do know from God's Word and say I can understand this much. So many times we go beyond instead of just saying here is where I put my stand on what God's Word has been revealed. That is the fact I put my faith in what I know, in what God has said, what God has revealed. But have you ever thought about, my friend, what the result is? A good feeling. You know what happens so many times in worship and religion? People get bored, and I don't understand how we get bored on this concept. When I worship, it's to the God who saved me. So often we think we need all these things the denominations have to get our emotions pumped up. That's superficial. I want to tell you, my friend, if you want to rejoice, rejoice in the truth. Rejoice in the facts. Let your heart be filled with joy that God loved you enough to save you from your sin. Rejoice in the fact that you can worship Him in spirit and truth, as John 4, 24 says. Be sure that it comes from the heart because that's what God is looking at. Your heart. God has always wanted the heart of man. Sometimes we talk about in the Old Testament they were more external, we're more internal. No, what was it David said in the 51st Psalm? He said, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. And think of the feeling you have. Think of the feeling of the individual who's not been faithful to God like the prodigal when he came home. What did it say he and the father did? They became merry. Open your Bible for just a moment to the book of Acts in the 8th chapter. When you come to the book of Acts in the 8th chapter, I don't know of a better example of facts, faith, and feeling in the proper order than Acts 8. In Acts 8, you have a man who's religious. You find that he was the eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now some people would say, well, as long as you're sincere and you worship, you're enough. That's not what Philip said. Notice Philip didn't care so much about his sincerity as he did that he was sincerely convinced about the facts. You can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Sincerity must be in truth. Sincerity is to make sure that our faith is genuine. And notice what Philip said to him. Philip in verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached his opinion to him. No, no, no. He preached Jesus. The facts. Then what did that man do? That man, when he saw the water in verse 36, he said, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He put his faith in the facts. And notice they went down and he was immersed into Christ. And notice verse 39, they came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Eunuch saw him no more. Watch it. He went on his way rejoicing. There's the feeling. He's right with God. Look in Acts 16. You see the same thing in Acts 16 with the Philippian jailer. The Philippian jailer, you'll notice he was told what he had to do. He was baptized into Christ. And notice it said he and his whole family, what did they do? They rejoiced. Look in the Galatian letter and the fifth chapter. In Galatians chapter 5. Look if you will, verse 19. You see what the works of the flesh are. And notice... A lot of people will say, well, God doesn't care if I do those things. I want you to understand, God does care. God says they're contrary to His will. And you may feel like it doesn't make a difference, but what does the fact say? He said those in verse 21 will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, I'll tell you something. That is a fact. 
You may not feel that's right, but I want you to understand your feelings can be wrong. God has plainly and God has clearly specified that any of those actions that one continues in will lead them astray. But look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there's no law. You want joy? You want peace? What is it you're looking for in this life? I'll tell you what happens so often. We may not like what the facts are. So we want to put our faith in something we feel. I want to tell you that's the most dangerous place to put. We need to learn to conform our will to the will of God. Sometimes that's hard to do. Because sometimes we want our way. But I want us to understand He is the author of salvation. He's the one to tell us what we have to do. He will be the judge. We do not conform Him to us. We conform ourselves to Him. And put our faith in the facts. Then we'll have the feeling. When we were singing, did you not have joy? When you thought about how great our God is, I was thinking about that song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, that line, Teach Us How to Love One Another. Aren't those things that are great truths? And when I put my faith in what God has said, I can leave here with a good feeling. If you're here and you're not a child of God, you've never been baptized, I want you to understand, put your faith in what God has said and we will rejoice. The heaven will rejoice. It says the angels rejoice when one comes to God. Let us do what God has said and put our faith in the facts as together we stand and sing.